stop, stop procrastinating. Just do it. There's so many lessons like you and I, right, with, with our businesses have learned there really is no other way to do it, you know, than when you're up at midnight trying to understand tax law for your payroll. You know, like there's just no other way. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here for another episode of The Inventive Journey. Um, as, uh, as your host, or I'm your host and uh, the uh, patent attorney that uh, does patents and trademarks for startups and small businesses. And uh, we're walking you through another in- exciting uh, journey of uh, Dennis Underwood. So he'll be a great guest and we're excited to have him on. As a quick intro, um, Dennis is a bit of an accidental entrepreneur. Um, he worked, uh, he did, uh, did some comp- or competitions with competing people with TechCrunch. He's been served in Iraq, Did the, worked for the NSA, and now is doing a bit of uh, things on his own for uh, some data security. So I'll let him give a much better intro than I did, but at least that sets it up. So welcome to the podcast, Dennis. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. So, so why don't you, maybe we'll start out. I did a very brief intro, but every, you could certainly introduce yourself better than I can. So maybe walk us through kind of uh, a bit of your journey and uh, what's brought you up to this point. Yeah, and, and I'd say allegedly better, right? So, <laughs> actually, it was accidental getting into uh, starting a business. Uh, when I was sitting in an interview room, and there were a bunch of people there that were much older than me at the time. I was like 20. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably they were now the age I am now, which is kind of scary. But uh, what happened was, <laughs> yeah, they were all... Every, every, day, every birthday, it feels like, I used to think the people at my age were old, but that, now I'm yeah. there, and it's like... It doesn't feel so old, so. Now looking in the mirror, like, this is getting very serious. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to be an adult. Right, right, all the gray hair. But uh, either way, um, yeah, so how it started was I was competing for, at the time, was a college kid's IT help desk job. And I saw a bunch of people that were recently laid off, and I needed money to pay for pit at the time and pay for housing and things like that. And uh, I knew I wasn't going to win the interview against folks with 20 years experience. So I had to figure something out quick. So I actually walked out and a couple days later walked back in as Dennis Underwood Incorporated. Uh, and I, you know, I had nothing to lose. I was 20 and in college and paying my way through school. Right. Hmm. And uh, I ended up making more money and had flexibility to complete the tasks on my schedule, uh, which, you know, got a couple more clients that ended up being a good thing. And, Fast forward, you know, went to uh, went to Iraq, came back. Of course, the services businesses don't do well when the founder and the principal is gone fighting a war. But came back, uh, resuscitated the business, moved down to Charlotte at a time with the wife. You know, I was married by then. Uh, ended up graduating from grad school. Had you know, uh, had a house at that point. You know, family, two dogs. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna dive in for just a second because you jumped yeah, over a whole bunch it. of interesting things. So. You start, first of all, I, I think it's interesting. You're great that you went into the business or went into the interview and said, "Hey, I'm not never going to land this job because everybody has a whole bunch more of gray hair and experience. So I just get to go and start another business and it does well." But then what, during so that was interesting in and of its own. And then you decided. So you were you went and served in Iraq. Um, and was it which arm of the, or branch of the military was it? I was Army. Uh, when I was 17, joining field artillery and shooting stuff sounds really really cool. Um, not a good career move necessarily, except for the lessons learned, like school part knocks, you know? Yeah. So, so you did that. So you signed up and then you got, or Iraq happened. You didn't, and went and served. Sound like, you know, love, or thank you, first of all, for serving your country. And then you came back. You got to go to jail and keep for Canada, right? You know, so. (laughs) Yeah, well, I think that there's there's a lot of good things, a lot of much better to serve your country than the alternative. So thanks again for serving. And you came back, and so as you were coming back, because you have a lot of people that you know are going to the military, you serve your time, and you come back, and it's hard to transition or hard to figure out what you want to do. You know, kind of job wise, work wise, some of the skills transfer well, sometimes they don't. So how did you did you decide? Hey, I already started this business before I got called up. I'm just going to go back to it. Is that kind of thought, or how did you? kind of make that transi- transition back. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy. So I ended up bringing a whole bunch of SANS and other security books. I already knew I was getting into security uh, before it was really a thing. I was just good at finding hackers and figuring stuff out. And in between missions and, and journeys while over there, I would pull the SAN, you know, my SANS security textbooks out from my rucksack and would uh, study. Because I knew that 
uh, when I go back, yeah, there, it, this is temporary. And when I get back and get out, uh, I'm going to need to bring everything back to life, right? Um, mm. Fun little fact, you see all the Qurans over there that are like thread bound, uh, very fancy. So mm. my Sam's books and my textbooks were glue bound. Glue does not work well when it's 130 degrees outside. <laughs> uh, so I was actually chasing chapters from my books down, you know, as they blew away. Because uh, the books literally would fall apart in my hands because the glue would just turned into mush. Huh. I, that, that I wouldn't have ever thought of. It, it makes perfect sense, but I wouldn't have thought that all the glue that, from the books that you would have normally had a five time reading would have all started falling apart. That's, that is a funny story. Yeah, it was a bit of a mess because uh, people would be, you know, hanging out nearby, uh, Iraqis and such. And uh, it took me way too long to figure out the faster I ran after my textbook pieces the more valuable they thought those were. And I could never outrun them. I was never that good, right? <laughs> so I had to let them go after a while. And, and when I got back, as from my business back up, actually, I could almost tell exactly where the chapters were that I had, had gone missing, right? You know, in, in the, in the, the country, uh, because I'd get to a section and say, why am I not knowing this? You know, and then I'd go back to my textbook and see that it's a big, a big gap, right? Where that chapter's gone and literally gone with the wind, you know? Uh, so, but I sorted that back up, uh, you know, uh, I was good, at least academically and theoretically, because I, I couldn't really have my, uh, my Metasploit, you know, Kali Linux laptop over there, uh, mm. you know, pen testing, but at least I had the book knowledge. Mm. So I, I was able to pick things up, back up very quickly, uh, get my business started back up in Charlotte again, uh, got a really good offer from, uh, from the Department of Defense, you know, uh, to go do work for them. Uh, so they hired me on. Uh, did that for a while, but uh, I'm sure it's a common theme for every one of your uh, guests is that once, once being an entrepreneur is in your blood, uh, it, it's not, it, it's hard to get rid of, you know, and so I, I tried that. I, I um, tried really hard to make the government do more and faster, more efficiently than probably any government is capable of doing, just like every other tech entrepreneur that goes, you know, to take a couple years in the government, uh, left, became a consultant for a while. Uh, but really what happened with the, the invention part is uh, I sat back and said, well, I'm not going to hire my way out of our security skill shortage that we have. Mm. And uh, it takes so long to find the art versus the science, that person who's just really good at finding hackers, you know. So I said, my only way out of this is to invent something. Mm. Now, that's how it started. Told the wife, she, you know, um, she said she's along for the ride, you know, it's always positive, right? You know, uh, and um, I mean, fast forward five years, we have what four patents internationally. We have a whole business focused on our, our products. We have a couple more patents on the way. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's, we're making it happen, right? And it's all about automating stuff that people can't possibly ever do fast enough or good enough. Mm. So, no, and th that is a great summary. I'm going to jump back because there's a couple cool things that you didn't, okay, uh, cool. didn't touch on. So when you went to the NSA before you started your own business, if I remember right, when we talked a little bit before the, the episode, you actually did it by winning a hacking competition. Is that right? Yeah, there was this, uh, I think it's much more, much bigger and more mature now. It's a collegiate cyber defense co uh, competition. Uh, and at the time it was much smaller. And I, I do remember, so our, our team won, uh, regionals and it was companies like PricewaterhouseCooper and Deloitte and, and other security consulting firms uh, very you know built very well regarded and I remember we won regionals so big uh, I was a bit cocky with the recruiters that were there uh, and kind of said hey um, if these guys are regionals who's gonna be at nationals right so we won nationals but I didn't see any recruiters I just saw people there that wouldn't tell me their name uh, it didn't have name badges or swag. Um, and I remember going back to my wife and we were talking about having our first kid uh, and, you know, had a house. And I said, honey, I, I really screwed up. Like, we, I got to go back and uh, apologize to all these people I was cocky and rude to to try to get a job, right? When I'm, you know, if, uh, or at least get a contract with them. And um, yeah, and that was interesting. But then, of course, it all worked out. And we found out that they were uh, somehow affiliated or, or tipped off the government, you know, one, one way or the other. So real, realistically, they're probably listening into this podcast right now, now that you've uh, been, on, or been on the NSA's list. <laughs> All right, probably not. Uh, it's, not that, it, it's not that interesting for them to want to listen in. So. All right, so you won that. You worked with the NSA for a while, and then you decided, hey, 
and dive into a bit. So, I mean, I know that you kind of said fast forward five years, but you know, if I were to outside world, you know, not knowing a ton about the NSA other than what I see on TV or movies, which I'm sure is completely accurate and no, no, no airs whatsoever in my understanding. But no. um, so NSA, you know, at least has a cool, or cool name to it. Everybody knows it. Seems like it'd be a cool job for, you know, cybersecurity or hacking and, you know, kind of working against the bad guy and all the things I see in the movie. Um, so jumping to that, what made you decide, okay, I, and I know you touched on lightly, I'm at the NSA, now I'm going to go back into private industry, I'm going to kind of do things my way or do something different. What made you decide to make that transition? Oh, wow. Um, so you put me on the spot here. So uh, <laughs> what ended up happening, and, and this is true for any government agency, is that uh, I got a little bit spoiled by uh, you know, walking back into that office at uh, year 1999 or 2000 or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And because when you're a consultant and you're an inventor and you have your own business, you can move as fast as you want to move, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's all about self-motivation. Um, and largely that, that could be true also, you could set of, of, of a rock, right? Where it was all about self-motivation, right? Mm -hmm. So I get back to this government agency and uh, their timetables and timelines are uh, much more in line with everything else in government all over the world, you know, much slower. Uh, you have to work within a bureaucracy. Um, I love watching Parks for Recreation because it brings back <laughs> memories. It was a little bit too raw at the time, but now it's been a couple years, right? So I look back and think, oh, that's right. You know, so, but I guess the point was, was that I, uh, you know, I, I had been beating uh, against, you know, government timelines where, you know, mm. people, some people actually do wait 30 years for retirement, right? You know, so, um, <clears throat> so I, I took a step back and said, uh, you know, I, I'm tired of beating my head against the wall in this way. I would like to do something different. So I tried okay. consulting because at that point I could have one foot in, one foot out, uh, you know, where I'm, I'm doing work, but then I could go at night and do coding or something else. Um, hmm. And then it got to the point where I realized uh, the consulting firms were also very similar. You know, as long as you were making the money by billing on government contracts they were they were happy mission accomplished mm. so i said you know um i really need to uh just leave and and go and and you know do my mission uh so i actually was poking around and you know i think i created like an llc you know just nothing big and i said i should start looking at this more and, and take this seriously uh at the time my employer made it a very easy decision for me i had the hazing that every good entrepreneur should have of getting mm. walked out and fired by your employer, you know, and then, <laughs> and that was it. I was, I said, oh, this is just like being back when I was 20 and uh, sitting in the interview room and realizing I'm never gonna get that job. You know, it's like you're, you're in for a pound and for a penny, you know, and so or for a penny for a pound. And so <laughs> hopefully you can edit that out, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, so that, that's what happened. And then I, I realized this is very real very quickly. And I came home to the wife and I said, uh, we're doing this. And and then we had, you know, and then she was actually happy for me. So that was cool. So now I'm going to dive. I'm not <laughs> I keep giving you a I'm One sorry. step deeper. So did they, <laughs> and not to pour salt, did they fire you? Did you quit? Was it mutual? You know, so my question was more of when you decided, hey, we're going to do this. Was it kind of you made the decision and that was yours? Or you said, hey, this is, now I have to do it. I got to make it work. And I think both are, or, you know, are, are good weight reasons to start. But I just was diving in a bit on that. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the leave from the government agency was just a normal thing. Uh, I was overseas, and I, I told the wife, hey, the, this promotion position, there's really no upward mobility to it. Uh, so we're going to hang out for a couple of years and enjoy jolly old England. Uh, and then the wife said, well, I really miss my mom. And, of course, we had two babies at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. So... Uh, that made the decision very quick, you know, very easy. And then a, a contracted company picked us up uh, and moved us back within two weeks. So that was good. Wife is happy. Kids are happy. Everyone is happy, right? Um, <laughs> so that's how that started. It was very, you know, very amicable. Of course, no, nobody likes losing a good engineer. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's always a little bit of tension there. But then the leap for my own business, yeah, it was, you know, uh, they, they saw that I was uh, um, on the way out and potentially a competitor. Um, mm. Again, that's that's not a new story, right? You know, I, I kind of looked at it and was like, at the time, I was like, well, that stinks, you know. But, um, but that's just, you know, you're on a journey. Like at that point, you're you're doing it. Yeah, no, I think that's very true. All right, wasn't trying to pour salt wood. I just thought it was an interesting thing. Just when you said you got, you know, I I had the picture of you had the box in your hand, and there you got the two security guys, and they're walking out of the building. 
So that was the idea. So I had to get, or just wanted to get a bit of clarification. Yeah, on that. They, I mean, they kind of like invited me. They said they had to meet me off site uh, out of the building. And then uh, I ordered a drink and sat down. And then they, I thought they were talking. We, we had some new, new contracts that I had brought to them. And, um, uh, and then they were just like, yeah, you're fired. And I was like, oh, well. <laughs> this conversation <laughs> went a little differently than I thought. Yeah, and I was like, I guess that's that, you know, but that's fine. I mean, I already had the LLC created, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, within 24 hours, I had work. It, you know, that's just no, the nature of the beast. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, and sometimes, I, and the reason I ask is I also, sometimes it almost takes that push, right? Sometimes we get too complacent or, you know, what we could do better, what, you know, and that's even, you know, me starting Miller IP Law a few years ago. I had a good job. It was a law firm. And if you ask my wife, she just said, why didn't you just stay there type of a thing? Because you make good money and you're, you know, you have good work and you everything else. And yet right. you're kind of saying, you know, I don't want to stay here. I want to do my own thing. And yet, you know, for a lot of people that ease of life or that complicity or that stops you from doing what you really want to do or what you really could do and make a lot better so i thought that was an interesting so you do that you now you know 24 hours later you already have your llc started up and now you're trying to think you know you have some work with great good for you that's you know much quicker than most uh, businesses start to get work in the door yeah well um, it's easier so with services right with, with products and inventions you have all those mm -hmm. sunk costs right um, so I did bootstrap with services. Uh, there, there weren't any really in investors nearby of the type that uh, every time I got an offer for an investment, I would look at uh, my ability to earn, right? Whether it's through myself or, or contractors, mm -hmm. bringing them on, whatever. And every time there was a number, the number was never big enough. I was like, well, I, give me 90 days. I can do that. You know, and so that's just kind of how it started. And looking back five years later, I'm like, well, there's, uh, there's some serious money at play here, you know? <laughs> That's, that's cool. So five years, you know, five years of being in the trenches now starting your own business. How has that gone? I mean, it, ups and downs, highs and lows, or how's that been for you? Lots of ups and downs. Absolutely. Um, I think I, I uh, uh, one thing I would advise people to do is uh, find a new market from where your previous employers were. Uh, that caused, that caused a lot more um, fierce competition, we'll say. Then if I would have just gone to a different market altogether, you know, and, and maybe moved out of the area or whatever I have to do to get a fresh start. It reminded me in the army where you'd have like a, uh, there's a rank called E4 in the army, which is like specialist. It's right below sergeant. Mm. And sometimes people had a hard time where they would leave as, as a specialist, just one of the guys, and they all of a sudden come back as the manager. Uh, I'm sure lots of places have this, right? Mm. And sometimes you end up, it's a better experience by going to changing army units because then you're new and you're known only as a manager. You're not, you're not the guy who used to go, you know, go drinking with them and all of a sudden now you're the boss, you know? So uh, it, it was a little bit like that where the, it was a change in dynamic uh, with the clients and, and, and with the peers and the competition. Uh, hmm. So I do recommend, you know, doing that. Uh, if there's any advice I can give anyone. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's definitely, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. There's a lot of highs and lows, certainly. Um, make sure you have good lawyers. Uh, make sure you have good support staff. Uh, the patent process, um, we, uh, we were smart to invest in that. We actually took out a loan to pay our first patent uh, and uh, found, found a great lawyer. Um, didn't know you at the time yet, Devin, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if it, you only great until you know me, and then it looks, makes them look like they're not. Right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I definitely recommend, I, I love the idea of having, of building something and putting your, you know, your flag kind of in the sand to build something that is lasting and making money, but more importantly for me, lasting and having an effort beyond what myself or my employees could do personally. And I think that's, uh, that's great because uh, now you have something tangible, right? Whether it's a, it's a patent, uh, whether it's the product in hand, the code, uh, mm -hmm. the widget, whatever. Uh, and even when I sleep at night or if something God forbid would happen to myself or the business, there's still value that was created that extends beyond me. And that's really uh, what I was going after with the product. The services got us there. You know, it, it, was, it yeah. was a good run. It is a good run, but that's just not where the focus is right now. All right. No, I, that, that, that all is very interesting. So I'm going to, you hit the key word of patents. And, and so you, and you said you took out a loan. So how, how did, because a lot of times, especially when you're a startup or small business and you're saying, Hey, we only have so much money. We only, and it doesn't matter how big you get either. It's always, you always have budgets and concerns and where you spend the money and, you know, what makes the most sense. And 
hey, should I hire another person? Or should I get to go get a patent? Or should I hire, you know, should I go buy new equipment? Or should I get new software? Or, you know, where to spend the money? So how did you kind of make that decision that this was, it was important enough to go take out a loan or you want, you know, that you wanted to invest in that part of the business? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we first did the provisional patent. And what was interesting is that there were people that were, we'll say, um, poking around our IP uh, mm. that we were already kind of figuring out and it was an R and D stage at that point. Right. Mm. So it made it really easy uh, to, to make the decision you know, I, I read online, how do you protect your code? Right. Mm. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, that was the best thing we could do at the time. We put in the provisional that protected us uh, partially. Uh, we had, I think my provisional patent was probably 30 pages long. It was, uh, my, my lawyer just kept having me write and write and write. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then we actually did the, uh, did the real one and went out internationally. Uh, and, uh, I'm really, really glad I did. Uh, cause of course it's, it's so global nowadays that, uh, we, uh, we started getting hits from people overseas over in Europe, Canada, Australia, Japan, uh, and. Uh, and of course china but that's not where we want to be um like don't don't <laughs> if your tool works against chinese hackers don't uh you know among others th they're not as interested in your you know being a customer right at least yep. a good way other way so we took up the loan it was the best investment i i, I probably made uh as far as uh like tangible non-personnel you know expenses um that was, uh, I think originally it was what a, a 10K loan and then I paid that back right away. And then of course, uh, the provision or the non-provisional patent, um, the 10K is like the first taste, that's like the teaser, right? And then, <laughs> then you get hit with all the fees and fines and not fines, but fees and, and, uh, uh, and the expense of uh, the patent attorney for the non-provisional, the real one, right? Uh, yes. So, uh, but it was worth, it was definitely worth every penny. And one day when I sell, I know that, that those patents will have value, even if everything else goes wrong, you know, uh, which hasn't, thank goodness. We still have that. Oh, that's cool. No, I, I agree. It's, it's, especially if you're to get into a lot of times the services or software that it's hard because code is, you know, code is one where people can make, they can do the same, they can code it a different way to accomplish the same thing, right? So you get a smart, two smart coders to say, hey, we do this. I can obviously, you know, they can design around it or they can recode it in the sense that they, you know, every coder has a bit of a different way. So that's why a lot of times you're saying, hey, you know, how do I protect software? And that one can be a harder one. So I'm, I'm certainly biased, but I'm certainly a proponent of protecting that asset. If you're going to put a lot of time and effort to build an asset out, that's going to have value. Patents are obviously a good way to do it. I know that's biased, biased advice for, for me because I, I have a self-interest in, in doing that, but I still think there's a lot of value there. So well, we're reaching towards the end of the podcast, um, but I always end off with two questions um, for the podcast. Um, so we'll, we'll hit on those now. So the first one is, what was the worst business decision you ever made? Ooh, um, so I have to walk a, a, a thin legal line here. Um, uh, even if you have to forego hiring the wrong person, uh, like, like, even if you think it, you know, trust your gut, I guess, when, when someone's coming in, even if all the advisors and all of the, uh, the books tell you that you need this profile, uh, if it's not a good fit in your gut, just don't, don't waste your time. You know, um, that, that was probably the biggest, uh, the biggest expense we had. Um, and, uh, it's also difficult to then restructure the team, you mm -hmm. know, that they, there, there's damage during and then there's damage after, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, having a good lawyer would really help there. Not, not necessarily an IP lawyer, more of like an HR lawyer to help you craft the story, you know, on the way in. And way. Lawyer and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's all I'm going to say about that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I won't push it any other than I, other than I, and I won't go with that. You know, I, I think that one is one that's, and I, and I made the same mistake, you know, I have, obviously don't have any thing that's barring me from saying anything, but, you know, when you get into hiring, at least for a lot of people and myself included, you always figure that everybody's going to work as hard as you are and everybody's going to do, everybody's going to be, is, is uh, you know, is, is want to make it building and or build it up and want to do a good job and everything else. And yet oftentimes, very seldom is that the case. Not everybody is like the founder or the co-founder, the person started and 
people either in there for a paycheck or they're in there for a short term or anything else. So I think that too often, you, you know, you get to a point where you want to rush in, hire someone because you have the need. And then, and too often you hire the wrong person or the wrong, and that one can be as costly in the sense of whether it's, you know, even if it's, you know, whatever the industry is, you have to pay an unemployment tax when they leave, or you have to do, you know, you have to spend more time and effort to hire a new person up or train one and buy it or find them and everything else. And so that's one that is, you know, I think it's almost universal across that is taking your time to hire the right person and then making sure it's the one that not only may look good on paper, but fits your company culture, fits the people you want. And you think it's, hey, this is someone that I can, will be there to help build the team as opposed to just, they look good on paper. So, right, oh, right. So I think that I think that's a good lesson to learn. Okay, and so I'll hit on now the second question, which is if you're getting someone that was wanting either just starting out in a startup or wanting to get into a startup or a small business, what would be the number one piece of advice you'd give them? Are we talking about a services startup or a product startup? I'll let you choose. Oh wow, okay. Um, <laughs> choose your so own adventure. Services startups are are easy to get into, right? Mm. Uh, you don't have really have any, uh, any upstart costs. You can just kind of go at it. Uh, every now and then someone will hit me up and they have all these like plans. They bought these books and they're going to do MBA type things. Mm. You've got to step out there and do it. I'm not saying get fired by your employer. That, that's certainly a, a tradition that a lot of us share, <laughs> yeah. which is fine. Um, but you know, there, there's other ways. I mean, the point is it, it wasn't about that. It was about me and, you know, taking that step out. So uh, I recommend doing that and, you know, learn all those lessons on a service company, uh, but make sure that you're, you're building that product. Uh, everyone has a different model for what they want. Uh, the product company, you know, don't, don't rush out to get an investor there. Uh, go ahead and just see if you can make it happen, you know, and especially nowadays in my field where software is a big equalizer, where you can really come out with a product, you know, and, and start adding value right away. Uh, without, you know, needing to build a factory to build shoes anymore, you know, or shoelaces or whatever. So I always tell people, uh, stop, stop procrastinating, just do it. There's so many lessons like the you and I, right, with, with our businesses have learned, there really is no other way to do it, you know, than when you're up at midnight trying to understand tax law for your payroll, you know, like, there's just no other way, you know, so it's got to get out yeah, there. And I, and I even went and got the MBA. I, I got way too many degrees, but even as much as, you know, I, I got a law degree, an MBA degree, an engineering wow. degree, and, um, also, you know, and Chinese just to throw it in and for good, for good measure. But even with all that, there is, you know, and so I think there's a, a place for education, but it also stops in the sense that whether it's, you know, whether it's college, whether it's wherever, there's practical application. And, and if you always are trying to read or always trying to figure out the perfect plan or the way, you know, what's going to be the you know, thing that makes you zero to a million in a week type of thing. You, if you never get in and actually do it, you're never going to figure out one, if you like you. And sometimes when people get in and they don't like startups or businesses and you learn that lesson or you learn the lesson that, Hey, I, I've waited way too long. I could have got this going, started to build it. So I think that's a great piece of advice is jump yeah, in I, and get going. I definitely would have been better off with some, some business education versus school of hard knocks and, and whatever I, sort of picking up a 20 when I'm begging the person to pay me, you know, that would have, uh, you know, um, but uh, uh, it would have been better. But when you're sitting there and it's time, it's time, you know, it's just one of those things. It doesn't matter if you bought the wrong shoes, you're running now. And, and even the, the, the school of hard knocks, even it doesn't matter how much education, everybody gets to go through the school of hard knocks. I, I remember sitting in here, you know, I was in an MBA class and I'm saying, this is all fluffy. And I get into real world, I'm like, why don't we have those people teach the class because they're going to know what they're actually talking about rather than the professors that never or went straight from acad or from a students to academic and they never have that real world application. So I think that everybody, no matter what path you take, has a school of hard knocks that they get to go through. Yeah, I agree. And it would be good also uh, to have a course material uh, taught by someone like that um, because mm -hmm. that gives you time to prepare emotionally uh, because there might be a section that really is you know impactful that that week or, or you're still not quite over yet maybe, maybe you made a mistake and, and you had to you know uh, recover from and having a q and a by the professor is much you know where you're put on the spot all of a sudden you know is much different than like i'm not saying you you know with with this but like <laughs> yeah <laughs> but having someone you know bring up an issue that you just either can't talk about or, or you haven't quite crafted that story yet that that's constructive for the students to learn from I think having, yeah, having uh, real life, you know, kind of in the uh, trenches entrepreneurs, it would be a good thing. 
Yeah, and, and I even, and now we, we, get, we could go off on this tangent for a very long time, but I won't go down too much for Apple. But I've been looking, you know, people too often, and, you know, because I do patent attorneys, so I play, you know, I, I work with a lot of startups and small businesses, and they'll ask a lot of times patent attorneys, you know, what you should do or what's business advice, because, you know, you kind of get an overlap between, should I do this, should I not do this, do you think this is a good idea, not a good idea, do you think it's patentable? And so they almost sometimes ask as much business advice, and I always say, you know, patent attorneys or, you know, attorneys in general give great legal advice and terrible business advice. And that's because they, most of the time, they've never done the business. They've never actually been through and done a startup or a business. They've never had to invest their own money in a patent. They've never had to make financial decisions. And so there is a much different feel when you're actually out and doing it as opposed to just learning the theory of it. So I, I think that's Absolutely. great advice. I agree. So cool. Well, I want to uh, thank you again for coming on to the podcast. It's been fun time. I always get to the end and I wish I had more time to, to go through all the rabbit holes and all the other things that would be fun to discuss, but we're reaching the end. But for people that want to reach out to you, whether it's they want to be a client, they want to be a customer, they want to get to know things better, or any other reason to reach out, what's a good re way to reach out to you? So I am very active on LinkedIn. If you look up Dennis Underwood, you'll get me and I think a pharmacy executive. Uh, so don't go to the pharmacy executive. Like Pharmacy. Yeah, we look nothing alike, so it's <laughs> easy to find me. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm always on there, and I'm um, willing to say hi. You know, just about anyone. Uh, of course, now now comes the onslaught of staffing agencies. But uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just laugh because I, I've I've been right there with you, so it's a laugh of com of commiserating with you. Yeah, it's, like, it's a sympathy laugh. I get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, let me know, uh, and I'm glad to give succinct, you know, advice. Um, if they want me to sign an NDA first, I, I get it. There's a lot of sharks out there. That's fine. Throw me whatever. I don't care. Um, I'm too busy to do anything else right now, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm glad to talk to people and um, glad to give some coaching. Uh, I, I would have to look behind me and make sure there's no one more senior there to coach <laughs> that person, you know, when you're the last guy standing sometimes. Eventually, it'll be the truth for both of us, right? That's right. That, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully be the last guy standing. We beat out everybody else. But. Right. But uh, yeah, but anyway, um, yeah, look me up and I'm glad to uh, give back. I think it's, start, it's time to start doing that, right? So I'm glad to give back some real advice and maybe introduce to some suppliers that I've learned I, I can trust uh, that versus uh, just random person and white pages. <laughs> well, thank you. And I'll certainly uh, direct people to LinkedIn. And that's always a great way, especially in the business, to, to make those connections. Thank you again for coming on. It's been a pleasure and it's been fun to have you on. Um, for those of you that are wanting to, uh, if you want to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. Um, if you want to go to inventivejourney.com, feel free to apply. And we're always looking for great guests that are at least as good as Dennis or maybe better. Well, if there's, if that's even possible, but uh, appreciate everybody and all the listeners. So if you want to be a guest, let us know. For those of you that are looking for a uh, patent or trademark return, if you're a startup or a small business and have some questions, feel free to reach out to myself and happy to sit down and walk through those questions. And uh, for everybody else, good luck on your journey and uh, may it be a fruitful one. Thanks again for coming on, Dennis. It's been a pleasure and good luck with your future journey. Hey, thanks a lot, Devin. Appreciate your time. You too. Bye.